What's up y'all? I just got back from Mexico and I have a lot of stories to tell. Today though, we're going to be talking about the giant pyramids of Teotihuacan, what I learned about the site, as well as a surprise cacao ceremony that we had in an underground lava tube cave. Mexico really blew my mind. There were a bunch of reasons that I decided to go on this trip. One being that I needed a break and I just had never been outside of the country before. And I'm very fascinated by the ancient Mesoamerican cultures like the Aztecs, the Maya, all of that, right? So when I went, that was primarily what my trip focused on was going to the museums and learning about these ancient cultures and Boy, did I get that. I took a tour of the pyramids with a local guide who grew up there in Teotihuacan. His name is Alejandro. Not only were the pyramids impressive, but I started to learn more about the engineering and the things and the beliefs behind the pyramids, and that was even more impressive. So let's get into the story. So Teotihuacan, if you don't know about it, is about 35 miles north of Mexico City and its heyday was from 100 BC to 400 AD. Because of a lack of records, very little is actually known about the specific people who created these pyramids, which adds even more mystery and awe to this whole thing. The main things that you see when you get to the pyramids are the Temple of the Serpent or the Temple of Quetzalcoatl, Quetzalcoatl, <laughs> the Avenue of the Dead, the Pyramid of the Sun, and the Pyramid of the Moon. And all of these are kind of connected in a giant series of complexes and there's a bunch of like other platforms and stuff there. So when we first arrived to Teotihuacan, the host had us standing right outside of the Temple of the Feathered Serpent and to the left of us was what he said was called the Avenue of the Dead. So we were actually there the day after Day of the Dead, so he really made that a point and he said that the even though it was the morning and the road looked empty, that it was full of the spirits of the dead who were making their journey during Dia de los Muertos. Which if you don't know too much about the holiday, it's not exactly like Halloween, but the idea is that you are wishing the dead well in their journey to the afterlife so a lot of traditions have you doing a little trail of flower petals that's kind of leading the way to where the dead would be walking so things like that and looking down the avenue of the dead you can see a giant dormant volcano in the background so we ascended the first set of little stairs that brings us into a big plaza and in the back of this plaza is the temple of the feathered serpent, aka Quetzalcoatl. Our host Alejandro began talking about how this whole complex was connected to nature and the elements. Just like you hear the pyramids of Giza are built in order to align with the constellation, this culture was also very astronomically minded as well as thinking of other elements. Rain, as it turns out, and water turn out to be a very big one. He described how the entire complex was built to utilize water in different ways. The plaza near the Temple of the Serpent where we were standing at first, one of the archeologists who studies this area believes that it was used to create a shallow pool of water. So they use this shallow pool of water to reflect the stars and the moon above them in order to study it better. So there's probably practical reasons for that, like it's easier to look down as opposed to straining your neck and looking up. But another spiritual, this is my guess, is that there's a spiritual significance in being able to match the stars by presenting it back and reflecting back. Just like how you would build the pyramids to reflect the constellation, what better way to 
honor it than to actually reflect a second image of it back into the heavens. So while I was there, I saw the edifices on the temple, which I had actually seen the replica of while I was in the Anthropology Museum in Mexico City. So I was seeing the real thing here, and it's just insane to think how these things have been exposed to the elements for so long, but they're still standing. And this site is actually still being dug up archeologically. They're still discovering things. Very recently, they discovered an underground kind of tomb that had a bunch of animals and people that had been sacrificed at that time. So in this area, there are like dozens of vendors who are all trying really hard to get you to buy something. So they always try to convince you that it's something you totally have to do, but you learn to say no to them. But one of them actually handed me this obsidian disc and I was checking it out like, all right, that's pretty cool. But then he motioned to me to look at the sun through it. And so I did and I looked through this obsidian disc and it's like one of those uh, things where you can see the solar eclipse like you could just look directly at the Sun through this black disc which looking through normally you wouldn't be able to see anything but it was just thick enough to where the sunlight could penetrate and you could look directly at the Sun and obsidian was a super valuable trade item for these ancient people because there was a obsidian quarry where they could get that rock nearby so it's safe to assume probably that the ancient people also did things like this to study the sun with obsidian. While I was here, I was still taking this all in, right? And especially when you're coming from Mexico City, this place is very quiet. And mostly all you can hear is the breeze and vendors trying to sell things. And a lot of the vendors were making these animal noises too. All in all, it had a very mysterious air and a gentle cool crisp quality to it all and it's a really nice feeling that i think you just have to be there to feel it the mystery of the ancients is just appalling it was incredible to me that they are able to build things this advanced and huge without the modern tools that we have for construction and it just shows how brilliant humans have always been, we just only had what we could work with at the time. These were definitely the oldest man-made structures that I have ever seen in my life. So we continued down the Avenue of the Dead and there's a bunch of square plazas that are kind of blocked off with little stairs. You go up, you go through the square, up the stairs, and you kind of keep making your way. So as we were getting close, our host Alejandro had us looking down at the stairs and then staring downward as we walked up the stairs. And then when we got to the top, we look in front of us and there's the Pyramid of the Sun and you can really see the complex well for the first time. He showed us how each one of these squares had its own features and uses, like how there were little single story apartment buildings, they had a cage for animals, they had showers, they had a septic system, and the entire thing is built to drain rainwater. So you could see these big drain hole things. So here's a little side fact I actually read about later. It's kind of dark. They would sometimes intentionally clog these drain holes so that the water could fill up and they could have that nice reflection. Well, guess what they used to stuff the holes to keep it from draining? They would use the body parts and the bodies of their sacrifice victims to clog the drains. That's just a pretty dark fact, but he showed us how this entire avenue of the dead was built at the perfect incline to be able to keep draining the rainwater. So then we get to the Pyramid of the Sun. This thing is massive in person. It's the biggest pyramid there, and it's just such an impressive behemoth. This thing is gigantic. Unfortunately, we weren't able to climb up the stairs. I didn't really get a clear reason why, if it's due to COVID or safety or what. I was kind of expecting we could go up the stairs, but turned out no. But it's okay, because really the view is looking at the pyramid itself. When you're on top of it, I'm sure you can see a lot, but 
the real thing is looking at the pyramid itself. And I actually got the chance to film some of me talking. Actually, I was filming some of me reading a poem from Jack Kerouac's book, Mexico City Blues, while I was in front of the pyramid. And this is another one of my video ideas that I'm cooking up for y'all and I'm working on it as well. So you'll see that and more of that later. Something else I noticed while we were at these pyramids was the prevalence of stray dogs. You'll see a ton of little dogs there and there was this one that was just sitting right in front of the Temple of the Sun on the stairs all majestically. Like how cool is that? It just looked awesome. Right after that we walked over to see the Pyramid of the Moon which is a slightly smaller pyramid but still really cool and it's surrounded by all of these platforms that are exactly the same height they have these four staggered layers and they had them all very symmetrical and like across from each other like if you think about how hard it is to make build something that's even and geometric now like think about back then like it really boggles my mind that they were able to do things this advanced. While we were by the Pyramid of the Moon, our host Alejandro was talking about some of the beliefs of the moon, like all of the myths and things like that associated with a full moon and just talking about beliefs around that. So I don't know how scientific all of that was, but I was feeling open-minded and trying to consider it in the context of the ancient cultures and what their beliefs were. He also briefly mentioned their knowledge of plants in the area. He even mentioned psychedelic plants like peyote and mushrooms. So it's possible that the people of this area had trade access to peyote from the northern regions of Mexico and maybe some psychedelic mushrooms from the southern regions of Mexico. And I later found out that this tour guide Alejandro actually hosts psychedelic ceremonies on the weekends. He does peyote and ayahuasca on the weekends. So right after we saw the pyramids, we got taken to a local restaurant and had a free included lunch. Guess it's not really free since we pay for the tour, but it was included. Right after lunch, we headed to the tour guide's neighbor's house. And at this neighbor's house, they had an entire chocolate shop, but it wasn't just regular old chocolate. They had raw cacao shipped to the house and it was prepared using traditional methods and turned into various chocolate snacks and drinks and all kinds of stuff. There was this one drink that I tried there called Polzo and it was made with cacao, corn, water, and cinnamon. And it was so delicious, man. I just drank like a bunch of it. Because cacao is slightly stimulating, they called this drink, which was an ancient drink, they call it the Mayan Red Bull, kind of as a nickname. So after this, we walked to another woman's house. When we got there, she was a healer and so she was offering cleansings and stuff like that but what we were really there for was the cave that was located in her front yard what was wild about walking to this lady's house was that you could just see the pyramid off in the distance it was like having a really cool view of your city skyline in your backyard except way way more ancient and i just couldn't imagine hanging out and seeing this pyramid just chilling there every day. So Alejandro had mentioned something about going in a cave and something about cacao earlier, right? But I guess it was kind of a surprise to all of us that we ended up going into this cave to have a full-blown cacao ceremony. So we didn't have that much cacao, but when we were at that cacao place earlier, he did give us like raw beans and we got to try some of those drinks and stuff. So we did have a little cacao in our system. So if you've never had raw cacao before, it is actually slightly psychoactive. It's not like it gets you high necessarily, but there is a tiny amount of stimulation and euphoria that if you're not on any other substance, it feels really nice. So we went down into the cave and it was really cool inside. And we kept going down and taking twists and turns and we finally got to this 
kind of large area where the cave ended. So this was an ancient lava tube that had hollowed out because the volcano is no longer active. And now it was a cave that went about 30 feet deep or 10 meters. Alejandro brought a few things into the cave. He had a traditional Aztec drum, which you can see me holding here. And he also brought a goblet that was burning this incense called copal. So this was the commonly found incense while I was in Mexico. It's the ancient Aztec resin that they use as a form of incense or Palo Alto. But yeah, it's called copal. Because of the lack of ventilation, he brought this thing down in the cave with us. I feel like we were hotboxing this cave with Copal. I felt like I might not be getting enough air, but I kept myself calm. And I feel like right as the cacao started to kick in, Alejandro began the ceremony. It started off with them singing and playing the drums. They were singing in the Aztec language called Nahuatl. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but they were also singing, singing some songs in Spanish. And the theme of the songs from what I could understand in Spanish, it was about connecting to the elements and connecting to your ancestors. And he had turned off the candles, so we were just sitting in the dark in this cave underground with a group of people and listening to them sing in this unknown language and playing the drums. And it went on for about 10 minutes and it became very trance-like. The songs in the darkness definitely primed my mind for ritualistic intention and I was in a meditative trance so after the song stopped he kind of went into a guided meditation and this is where I could really tell that this guy hosts psychedelic ceremonies because it definitely had that kind of sense of things like everyone's on their own inner journey but he's kind of narrating it a little bit the meditation was focused on connecting to your personal inner child. Actively visualizing your own inner child inside, you talk to them and you walk with them and you say the things that you wish you as a child could have heard, that comfort and reassurance that we all desperately need. And we would gladly receive this kind of advice from an older version of ourselves. When I was closing my eyes, I started to see these purple blotches kind of in my eyesight, behind my eyelids. And this is actually a thing that used to happen to me a lot when I was a kid. When I was going to sleep before bed, I would see these purple kind of splotches of color behind my eyelids. And something about that and just the fact that we were doing this meditation on the inner child, it reconnected me in a very visceral way to my childhood because I realized that I was seeing these purple blotches and I used to see them when I was like nine years old and it just made me feel the connectedness of this eternal moment to that eternal moment and it kind of just made me feel like my consciousness, although I've grown and changed a lot, it's the same fundamental consciousness that existed back then when I was a kid. As I comforted my own inner child, I told them to never let the curiosity and wonder die. The fact that I was in a place in life now where I could comfort my inner child made me realize how far I've come and how much I've grown. I was now in a place where I could comfort my scared yet imaginative inner child. It was truly healing and beautiful and I'm not gonna lie, I started to cry. I reconciled with all the things that tried to kill my inner child in my adult life and I felt powerful that I was able to keep that alive through all this time. It was a beautiful ceremony and I'll never forget it. And after that we went to an agave farm and a pulqueria where they create this other Aztec drink called pulque. So agave is what they use to make tequila, mezcal, and pulque. But pulque is like a fermented, sour, milky beverage. And it's really good for you because it's fermented and it was delicious. So we got to all have a free cup of that. It became a regular part of my diet while I was in Mexico City. Well, hope you enjoyed today's story. 
You can support me in the channel by liking and subscribing. This is going on to a playlist that I have called Literal Trip Reports where I share my travel experiences, which don't happen that often, but when they do, I'll be sure to make videos like this and share the stories. And one of the things I realized coming back from this trip is how similar taking a vacation or a trip, especially to another country, how similar of an effect that has on your mind in the same way that psychedelics do. When I came back from this trip, I felt so refreshed and alive and everything felt new and I felt like I was looking at my familiar world with a new lens. And that is invaluable. To be able to refresh yourself and restart your brain like that, I think is vital for just the sanity and mental health of people. So I encourage you to go travel wherever that, wherever that is, even if it's within your own area, but just somewhere else. Like go get out of your comfort zone and go explore and you will feel the same positive benefits that you do from psychedelic trips. So thanks for watching my video. I appreciate all of you who watch this and leave comments and interact and I've met a few of you in the Discord server now. So thanks so much and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.